the imagination is a dimension of non-local information. Quantum physics is now moving towards securing the idea that in some kind of a mathematical superspace, all particles in the universe maintain a kind of super state of connectivity called Bell's non-local connectivity. Uh, what this means to me is that the imagination is uh, literally another dimension, a dimension that is non-local. Now, the mind, uh, the animal mind, the human mind, the paleolithic mind, evolved as a um, master coordinator of sensory data coming into the body from the senses about the level of threat and danger in immediate three-dimensional space. That's the mind's evolutionary function, to preserve the body, to preserve the genetic stream of unfolding by detecting and avoiding threat. And so our minds have evolved in the same way that water takes the shape of its container. Our minds have evolved to take the, ta the shape of three-dimensional space and time under cultural uh, under cultural and environmental pressure. Well, we've paid a huge price for this. It probably also has ensured that we're here this afternoon to discuss it. But it's been a long time since the instantaneous reflex to bash the brains out of anything moving near you that's unfamiliar has served us well. You know, I mean, that, that got old 12,000 years ago. The entire enterprise of civilization has been about something else. The felt presence nearby, ineffable, unsayable, but uncannily penetrating of beauty, of mathematical connectivity, of supernatural power. And so these are the things, the exploration of which, the singing about of which, make us human beings. The exploration of the universe of the unseen is the business of human beings. It's why we are the way we are. It's why we will be the way we will be. It's how we got where we are. How is it done? It's done by dissolving ordinary cultural boundaries, by perturbing consciousness, and by paying careful attention to the results and attempting to build models therefrom. Now, in the last few thousand years in the West, this enterprise has been tamed by priestcraft, which combines the enterprise with judicious politicking and a certain amount of ass licking. Before that, the enterprise was untainted by such secular concerns. It was full force forward into the unknown. And this is the great era of shamanism. And what is shamanism but philosophy with a hands-on attitude? Philosophy not made around the campfire but philosophy based on the acquisition of extreme experience. That's how you figure out what the world is, not by bicycling around in the burbs, but by forcing extreme experience. The reason people refer to psychedelic endeavors with the vocabulary of travel, taking a trip, and so on, is because that is an extreme endeavor. It's the same endeavor. It's the leaving behind of the values of your own culture. You know, take nothing but a change of clothes, fly to Benares, and take up residence at Dasasamid Ghat among the Charas Sadhus, 
And I guarantee you, whether you resort to psychedelics or not, uh, you will experience boundary dissolution, a reorienting of categories, and a reframing of your perspective on uh, your life and your being. So extreme experience is the necessary key. This is true in all forms of endeavor. I mean, if you, if you want to understand the atom, you have to smash it. You know, sitting around looking at it, it will never yield its secrets. You have to smash that sucker to bits and then collect the pieces and then examine exactly how it all uh, came apart. In the same way, and without you know, going too far afield for the pun, we must smash ordinary consciousness, get smashed and then look at the pieces flying in all directions and say, you know, gee, I didn't know minds could do that. Uh, well, uh, they can't in the workaday rote of, you know, living inside the little boxes of positivism and constipated behaviorism and all the rest of it. So, extreme experiences. But, you know, you don't want these experiences to be too extreme or you will sever the connectivity among the various subsystems and then we'll have to bury you. And this is always a, a huge strain on those left behind. So uh, there is a practical element here, which is, okay, so we want to have extreme experiences, but we don't want to have such extreme experiences that we don't live to tell the tale. Uh, we want control to some degree over these experiences. Well, this is where the um, incredible thoroughness of our human ancestors comes to our aid. Throughout time and space on this planet, our remote, the tribal societies that preceded us made it their business to discover, catalog, and learn to manipulate plants in the environment as the carriers, as the sources of chemical compounds in the environment, which would work extraordinary transformations on consciousness without uh, physical harm, without physiological damage to the organism. Uh, and of all the many techniques, ordeal, abandonment in the wilderness, sexual abstinence, uh, hanging by your pectoral muscles from hooks in the sun for days, uh, all of these sorts of things, of all of these methods, psychedelic plants and their judicious use is arguably uh, the most effective, the, now get that, the most effective and the least invasive and the most likely to uh, produce negative long-term consequences. Well, this was not news or even controversy anywhere in the world until uh, within the confines of the 20th century, basically, uh, the presence of these substances and plants began to alarm the order-keeping forces of the high-tech industrial democracies. An issue separate from the issue of stimulants and depressants, it's an issue separate from the issue of addiction and dependency. These things are not stimulants or depressants and they do not cause addiction or dependency. What they cause is what I'm advocating, a fundamental revaluation of cultural values. Because culture, as we are practicing it currently, uh, is um, causing a lot of pain to a lot of people and animals and ecosystems, none of whom were ever allowed to vote on whether they wanted this process to go in this direction. We do not feel what we are doing. Remember I spoke about the primacy of the felt moment of experience. If we could feel what we are doing, we would stop doing it. But between us and the consequences of our action, there are endless veils of political rhetoric, stultification, denial, uh, sedation, intoxication, ideological 
delusion. Now, n- n- normally, I, th- I think a rap like this tends to, if you have to pigeonhole it, to come down on the uh, side of pessimism. But I am, I am not pessimistic. I see everything as though it were integrated and connected, and there is an unfolding and a plottedness about our situation. It's not for nothing that at the very pinnacle of the age of faith in the machine and science and male dominance and projection of strategic weaponry and so forth and so on, that there should come from the gentler societies of the world, from the rainforests and high deserts of the world, the news of these plants. You know, the Western mind, the cataloging mind, the Cartesian mind in its frenzy to locate, list, isolate, and define everything carried these plants and substances over the past 150 years into the confines of our society, and they are much like Trojan horses left there by the bedraggled, beat down, uh, uh, disenfranchised, third world shamanic people to be found by the white-coated priests and priestesses of science and to be brought back into the laboratory to be picked apart for their efficacy in treating addiction or overcoming neurotic behavior or something like that. But of course, the neurotic behavior that they uh, impact upon is neurotic behavior so wide, so deep, so revered that it is in fact cultural values themselves. Uh, you see, what is happening, I think, is uh, it's, it's really bigger than psychedelics. It's bigger than human evolution. We are not making the waves in this ocean. We are our corks riding the waves of the ocean. But we are uh, privileged by perhaps chance alone to occupy a unique moment in the history of the universe. A moment when the universe goes through some kind of self-transforming, evolutionary, inflationary expansion. That's what's happening. I mean, it's been happening for a long time. It depends on where you pull back to, to get your perspective. One could say, looking at the universe in general, that this planet has been favored from the very beginning. That by a billion years ago, the discerning could tell that this was a planet going places. Uh, But certainly, by 500 million years ago, it was clear that this was a planet going places. Uh, One complex animal life form gave way to another. Uh, Catastrophes, yes, but never catastrophes so total that the enterprise was wiped out. We know that 65 million years ago, a catastrophe, an asteroid, a planetesimal impact occurred on this planet. Nothing larger than a chicken walked away from that on this planet. A bad day, you say. (laughs) But were it not for that bad day, uh, our sto- we would still be the egg-eating shrews at the edge of the reptilian garden party. Uh, these marvelous flowering plants chock full of psychedelic alkaloids, none of them would have existed. The flowering plants and the higher mammals all arose in the wake of this planet-scouring catastrophe. So, you see, uh, there is a, a built-in to the larger systems of nature, an enormous, uh, what my mentor Eric Jansch used to call, metastability. They are metastable. They are not easily deflected. Uh, An event as large as a planetesimal impact basically only resets the evolutionary clock by a few million years, and then in almost overleaping itself to make up for lost time, out of all of that catastrophe come uh, primates, 
animals of such complexity and coordinated sensoria that they are uh, wonders to behold and from them and quickly then come uh, abilities never before seen in the world of organic organization freely commandable languages spoken languages symbolic activity for the first time well at that point you know even the academics believe human language is less than 40,000 years old that means it's as artificial as the uh, dirigible or the uh, hypodermic needle it's an invention of some sort within the confines of human history or at the beginning of human history recall in South Africa we have fire pits and stone tools two million years old those are not homo sapien tools but they're the tools of homo habilis the preceder the, the, the preceding ancestor uh, in the human line uh, my point is we are caught up in a process of unfolding complexification that has now lodged in our species we are its source at this point at one point its source was the geology of the planet at a later point closer to us in time its source was all biological diversity but as the novelty has increased the domain of its expression has narrowed and it is now confined largely to the human species oh yes the rest of nature continues the slow unfolding of continental drift and gene mutation and transfer and so forth but these things have now receded into the background as the human adventure takes center stage uh, so it's almost as though in fact this is what I believe that we are not pushed from behind by the causal unfolding of historical necessity but that we are in the grip of an attractor of some sort which lies ahead of us in time and so we are not as it were following what the statisticians call a random walk across the temporal landscape in fact the temporal landscape is a canyon with incredibly steep walls and we are only free to move within very narrow confines as the the grip uh, almost the morphogenetic intensity of the attractor at the end of time increases its penetration and its hold over our imaginations our uh, city plans our technologies our religious ontologies our medical strategies so forth and so on something is revealing itself to us through us and as we get closer the chatter of noise and static being given off of this thing increases exponentially because you know McLuhan said once he said we move into the future like a person driving who uses only the rearview mirror that's how we understand the future by driving in the rearview mirror all of our models of what lies ahead are based on inverted models of the past and the one thing you can be certain of is that won't do it because we can see a person standing in 1900 using that method would have been wrong about the late 1990s a person standing in 1600 using that method would have been wrong about the late 1900s and so forth and so on you cannot extrapolate from the future into the from the past into the future because the real nature of the future is its being on siege the thing in itself and that's what it's trying to reveal and so the whisperings that reach the ears of the channelers the visions that come through the hands of painters sculptors choreographers musicians uh, uh, all of the felt presence of the invisible world is now incredibly pregnant with this message of transformation and the challenge for each of us is to streamline our language sufficiently that we may mirror this thing in a way that is both true to it and rationally apprehendable to ourselves